first of all, no, first of all, let me grab the pointer. It's this one, right? So this is a, actually it's a picture taken from the husband of the uh, postdoc who made uh, most of the most of this work, Sonia Albini, and this is the uh, this is the uh, square at the center of Rome. It's a very busy uh, square at the Stazione Termini, the station train <coughs> in Rome. And it's so busy in the night for different purposes than in the day because the train station is closed, uh, that all the cars take several directions. So remind that uh, a little bit the, uh, uh, the fate uh, of uh, human embryonic stem cells, which can take uh, a lot of directions. And uh, on the night time, without anyone order them, uh, uh, they are confused. Um, so this kind of confusion uh, can be used by, uh, uh, at least by scientists, uh, uh, to actually um, provide the way to direct embryonic stem cells uh, for different purposes. In the case of uh, uh, neuromuscular disease, it is very important uh, to have uh, available the generation of uh, uh, muscles from human embryonic stem cells, essentially from um, uh, two different perspectives. To obtain uh, an unlimited generation of muscle progenitors that can be transplanted uh, uh, for the treatment of neuromuscular disease, but more for our purpose uh, to provide uh, uh, something that doesn't exist yet, which is the three-dimensional contractile structure suitable for in this model of neuromuscular disease. So uh, right now, um, as we stand, uh, uh, there is not available model, three-dimensional contracting model of uh, um, uh, skeletal muscles. And uh, this actually prevents the use of uh, uh, contractile uh, uh, 3D uh, skeletal muscles uh, to model certain disease and discover drugs for this disease. And the uh, one bottleneck on this is the idea of achieving, uh, achieving uh, a 3D structure that can undergo contraction. So our question was, how can we instruct the human embryonic stem cells to form three-dimensional contracted skeletal muscles and for miniaturized myofibers for in this disease modeling? And a, a very important concept, a very important transition is the, um, is the formation of the mesoderm. So normally, uh, we obtain, uh, uh, I mean, uh, other scientists have obtained uh, skeletal muscle cells uh, starting from uh, human embryonic stem cells that are in transition through the mesoderm. But this clearly limits the possibility to obtain an homogeneous population of stem cells that can cluster and form a uh, uh, human embryonic, uh, uh, and form a uh, uh, sort of uh, contracting muscle. So the big question mark is how to convert uh, uh, stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, into muscle progenitors, let them cluster into uh, embryo-like bodies that instead of forming three lineages would uniformly form uh, uh, skeletal muscles uh, that would likely uh, uh, generate contracted myofibers. So the first question to address here is whether uh, the typical myogenic conversion that occurs invariably in most of the uh, somatic tissues, as described by Harold Wendraub uh, uh, probably 30 years ago, uh, and by which a fibroblast uh, ectopically expressing myoD can be converted in uh, uh, skeletal myotubes. Can this process be also observed in uh, human embryonic stem cells? So Sonia Albini uh, decided to address this uh, by comparing the conversion of uh, human fibroblast and human embryonic stem cells? And the answer is very straightforward. The conversion that typically occurs in fibroblast does not occur in uh, human embryonic stem cells. So uh, we've been wondering for a while uh, uh, what was the reason for this uh, resistance of human embryonic stem cells. And while screening a number of epigenetic modifiers, we noticed that a very important component uh, of the uh, chromatin remodeling complex, as wise well chromatin remodeling complex, BAS-60C, was selectively 
absent in uh, three of uh, our uh, um, human embryonic stem line, H1, H7, and H9, where it's clearly present uh, in fibroblasts that get converted by myoD. So why sniff chromatin remodeling complex? It's a critical uh, uh, complex to remodel the chromatin at the myogenic loci in order to activate transcription, muscle-specific gene uh, expression. And this has been discovered by us and by Imbel Sanders group uh, uh, about 10 years ago, showing that the recruitment of the whole complex by MyoD is required for MyoD-dependent activation of gene expression. And bas 60 is one of the many structural non-enzymatic uh, component of this complex. Later on, we described that bas 60 c it's actually very important to form a bridge between the enzymatic compartment, uh, the enzymatic uh, um, um, subunits of the Swaysniff complex and MyoD. bas 60 c can be present together with MyoD at the myogenic loci prior the uh, recruitment of the rest of the enzymatic competent Swaysniff complex, which is stimulated by uh, the activation of this kinase. This is a P38 alpha kinase, which is normally activated upon uh, regeneration stimuli, and uh, by phosphorylating uh, threonine in bas 60 c allows the recruitment of the enzymatic components of the Swaysniff complex, thereby activating transcription. So here it's clearly shown that BAS-60C is expressed in most of the somatic tissues, but it's not expressed in the human embryonic stem cells. And the expression of BAS-60C, which tends to occur along with the formation of the embryonic bodies, correlates with the competence of embryonic bodies to get converted by MyoD. So the most straightforward experiment Sonia did was to uh, see whether co-expression of BAS-60C could actually allow, enable uh, MyoD to activate uh, skeletal myogenesis in human brain stem cells. And the answer was yes, although it wasn't so striking. You see here the difference between MyoD without and MyoD with BAS-60C. So still not comparable to the efficiency that we observe in fibroblasts, but this experiment clearly told us that BAS-60C was an important component for MyoD to activate skeletal myogenesis in uh, human embryonic uh, stem cells. The second step, very important transition uh, uh, that Sonia uh, decided to address was whether maybe clustering these cells into structures that uh, mimic the embryonic body could provide the signal. So what she did is to set up uh, 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 an entire protocol uh, starting from two infections with the uh, lantivirus, BAS-60C, MyoD, aggregate these cells that contain both BAS-60C and MyoD into floating clusters. Assuming that this floating cluster may actually provide signals that give the competence of the complex to assist MyoD-mediated uh, gene expression. And then uh, dissociate the embryoid bodies, uh, these kind of uh, aggregates, let's call them aggregates, and uh, see whether once they're dissociated, they are formed mainly by uh, skeletal uh, muscle cells. And this was the case. As you can see, only upon the uh, uh, expression of BAS-60C and MyoD, most of these floating clusters were formed by cells that upon dissociation could form a myosin heavy chain positive myotubes, supporting the idea that BAS-60C is the key epigenetic factor that provides the competence for myoD-mediated activation in uh, H9. But we wanted to take this opportunity to see whether these kind of clusters made by sort of uh, myogenic committed uh, uh, human embryonic stem cells, if left uh, aggregated, could form the 3D structures I was referring before. So what Sonia did was to do exactly the same protocol, but rather than dissociating the embryoid bodies, she was keeping the floating embryoid bodies, and after she tested several media, she came up with uh, uh, an insulin-containing medium that is typically considered the muscle differentiation medium. And then she performed the staining after 15 days. So what was the fate of these cells? Well. 
while normal uh, cells without myoid D or BAS60C tend to form uh, the embryoid bodies. With myoid D, the embryoid bodies had a little bias towards cardiomyogenesis, but with myoid D and BAS60C, all the embryoid bodies gave rise to uh, myofibers that clustered together into 3D structures that later on we observed to be actually, let's see if it works. It doesn't work every day, but today is a good day. So, uh, so as you can see, these kind of structures were not only formed by uh, myofibers, but were also provided with the ability to contract. And the contraction, uh, well, the dissociation still shows that those are uh, skeletal muscles rather than cardiac muscle cells, but also the contraction uh, uh, type was clearly discriminating these uh, myospheres from what is typically calcium transient of cardiomyocytes. So uh, this was uh, uh, a, a protocol for uh, formation of uh, a three-dimensional uh, skeletal muscles from urine-embryonic stem cells, but wasn't enough to provide an in dish disease modeling. We needed to jump into the iPS cells. So what Sonia did was to use the human embryonic stem cells and the iPS cells in parallel and check whether from the iPS cells we can actually recapitulate the same process, and the answer was yes. The efficiency is now much higher because she decided to move into a piggyback, uh, the you know, Sleeping Beauty transposon activated myodiba 60C uh, system, which allows way more potent uh, uh, gene expression. All the cells express the, um, the myodiba 60C. And uh, when uh, she used the same technology to form the uh, myospheres, she was able to uh, actually recapitulate the same process and generate contractile 3D myospheres from IPS of uh, normal patients, normal individuals, but also from Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients. And here is exactly where we are going. So we're trying to use uh, patient-derived cells, uh, IPS cells, convert them into these 3D uh, contracted structures and see whether <clears throat> after contraction, when most of the uh, pathogenesis becomes evident, uh, we can actually recapitulate uh, salient features of disease uh, and possibly use this technology for uh, a personalized discovery of uh, not only uh, unknown pathogenic uh, events, but also uh, therapeutic opportunity. So, uh, since we are very interested in translational medicine, but by uh, background, by primary interest, uh, we are still uh, uh, very much uh, fascinated by um, epigenetics and molecular biology, we decided to use this um, conversion of uh, human embryonic stem cells or iPS cells uh, to uh, investigate from uh, an epigenetic standpoint, human skeletal myogenesis, which is still kind of uh, uh, not fully investigated. And we use this uh, to understand uh, how the epigenetic landscape um, <clears throat> can allow myogenic conversion in the presence of BAS60C, but not when myoD is expressed alone. So the... Um, the question uh, was even more uh, intriguing when considering that myoD, which does not activate skeletal myogenesis in human embryonic stem cells, it's actually supposed to bind pervasively the human embryonic stem cells, given the fact that in the pluripotent cells, human embryonic stem cells as an epigenetic landscape, that should be permissive for muscle transcription factor DNA binding. So the first question was, does myoD bind or not? The E-box, which is the consensus binding site, consensus binding site human embryonic stem cells. And we decided to approach this by <clears throat> chromatin monoposidation uh, for myoD and the RNA-seq uh, uh, to understand uh, whether the myoD genome-wide binding pattern uh, has a, a transcriptional output different depending on whether BAS60C was expressed or not. 
The chipsick for my ID was giving a sort of, an, uh, well, I would say expected by us uh, results. So my ID alone, which is this, clearly binds uh, way more loci, way more uh, genomic regions than uh, uh, in the presence of bas cc There were some uh, 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 binding sites that were overlapping between MyOD and MyOD bas cc but clearly the ability of MyOD to bind the DNA was superior in the absence of bas cc What was the transcriptional output? So we, we um, uh, investigated by René Sick the transcription output at two stages in undifferentiated and EB day number five. And as you can see at the very beginning, actually, myod bas 60 c can modulate mm. gene expression much better. But later on, this massive pervasive binding of myod results in a much higher transcriptional output. So what is the quality of gene expression upon myod binding with or without bas 60 c as you can see here, we have a BAS60C alone, BAS60C MyOD, and MyOD alone, undifferentiated and EB day five. And you can see clearly that in the absence of uh, uh, my, in the absence of BAS60C, MyOD has a much better ability to activate gene expression at both stages. And the gene expression is clearly not only skeletal muscles. You can see the activation of uh, uh, neurogenesis, cardiogenesis and other non-muscle lineages. While in the presence of bas 60 c most of the transcription is repressed. And the only transcription that is still active, it's only the differentiation of skeletal muscles. Indicating that bas 60 c somehow narrows down the ability of myOD to productively bind uh, uh, muscle loci. And as a matter of fact, when we investigated uh, the fate of cells that express only myOD, we could see features of uh, cardiac uh, and uh, neurogenesis in addition to some sporadic activation of skeletal myogenesis. So the neurogenesis is especially important when you consider a very interesting paper from Tapscott that came out a couple of years ago. So both myOD and neurod can recognize the e-box. However, there are some e box that are shared by the two factors, which normally activate general features of differentiation. And then it is discriminated by a chip seek uh, experiment, uh, a private e box uh, where the denucleotide is GG for myOD, specific for skeletal myogenesis. And the private uh, um, uh, e box where the denucleotide is GA which correlates with neurodemediate activation of gene expression, neural gene expression. So when we went to distinguish these two different type of binding, we found that actually the ability of bas 60 c to impose a binding that is myOD private was 53% versus the 36% of uh, uh, the uh, uh, ability of uh, uh, myod alone uh, to recognize this private binding site. Indicating that bas 60 c can actually uh, uh, sort of um, impose a preferential binding uh, to this myogenic specific e box. So just some uh, 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 chip seek uh, data to show that, for instance, there are some uh, common genes which are bound by myOD in the absence or in the presence of bas 60 c There are other genes, skeletal muscle genes, that are bound only by myOD and bas 60 c ACTA1. And this is probably because by, um, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, a fair, which I don't have the time to explain, but uh, you should just believe me, it's an essay where every time you see this situation means that the uh, nucleosomes are remodeled. The chromatin is more permissive for transcription. So the, um, the chromatin remodeling is clearly stimulated only in the presence of bas 60 c on certain myogenic loci, and this results in a preferential uh, recruitment of uh, polymerase II and, uh, of course, elongation on the codigine of polymerase II. But more interestingly, see here, 
you see that there are certain uh, neurogenic genes which are only bound by myOD in the, uh, in the, in the absence of BAS6CC. While when BAS6CC was introduced together with, bio, uh, with myOD, it prevented the binding of myOD to neurogenic sites. So uh, we, we believe that uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the job uh, of BAS6TC is to prevent this illegitimate pervasive myoid binding to a non-myogenic e-box. And this is our model. So in the absence of BAS6TC, myoid pervasively bind uh, uh, most of the genome in human embryonic stem cells, giving rise to productive and non-productive binding on non-muscle e-box uh, and some shared box, uh, which which justifies the ability of myOD to activate several lineages which are driven by EBOX, while in the presence uh, of BAS6TC, myOD gets stick to uh, its natural target genes and can activate uh, 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 muscle transcription, uh, specific muscle transcription, uh, possibly by opening up the chromatin recruited uh, polymerase 2 and uh, uh, promote skeletal myogenesis. I want to give uh, full credit for this to uh, Sonia Albini, who spent five years moving the project along and made an exceptional work, uh, but also with the uh, uh, help of uh, Paola Coutinho, Alessandra D'Alegnese, and Solegato, who analyzed all the bioinformatic data. Thank you for the attention. Be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lorenzo. That was great. Maybe in the interest of time, we have time for maybe just one question. Sure. Great talk, Lorenzo. Uh, NeuroD also important in pancreas, in addition to the nervous system. So those myoD cross binding to the site, there was a neural or pancreatic NeuroD binding sites. And is there any preference if there is? We don't know about the preference, but what we notice is that by gene ontology, uh, we observed features of pancreatic differentiation. Um, I don't know whether this is related to the ability to bind e-box that are normally bound by NeuroD or not, but uh, we have observed uh, uh, features of, well, kind of genes that belong to the pancreatic lineage activated by myoD alone. We have never tested the, the, the expression of pancreatic genes in H9 expressing myoD, which is something we should probably do. Very good. We have, so have you taken a similar approach of these uh, spheroids getting at satellite cells, for example, instead of a, a um, myo, myoblast or myo, yeah, that myotube was, type? Yeah, that was a great interest. Uh, we got a student uh, that was fully engaged on this project. Uh, and uh, we do have evidence that there are some Pax7 positive cells. Uh, but whether uh, uh, these cells are actually satellite cells and whether these myospheres can actually recapitulate the uh, uh, muscle environment, the uh, environment with the niche, yeah, yeah, right. uh, it's still to define and we do not have any conclusive evidence for this. Okay, okay.